I only hope that we never lose sight of one thing that was all started by a mouse. By the mid-2000s, the mouse was old news, and Disney had spent 20 years trying new thing after new thing after new thing to make Mickey Mouse relevant again. It wasn't until 2006 that the company finally found success, but with an audience that nobody could have anticipated. And even more shocking are the elements that led to its creation. With a changing media landscape, government intervention, and even a big blue bear in a house that led to the creation of one of Disney's longest running franchises. Hot dog, hot dog, hot diggity dog, it's a brand new day, what you waiting for? Today we wrap up the final chapter in Disney's quest for modern mouse with the story of Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Wait, did I say Big Blue Bear? That's not right. Say it with me. Miska, Mosca, Mickey Mouse! So at this point, between my last two videos, I think we've already established just how desperate Disney was to get Mickey Mouse back into pop culture throughout the 90s and early 2000s. They tried going extreme with Runaway Brain, but the in-your-face attitude turned off traditionalists and some parents with younger children. They tried playing it safe with Mickey Mouse works, but the slower pace of these animated throwbacks turned off adolescent kids who had no connection to these characters. And while how House of Mouse did prove to be a success by leveraging just about any and every recognizable Disney animated character ever, its dependency on repackaging those Mouse Work shorts meant that its shelf life was also limited. Sure, the faces of Mickey Mouse and friends would continue to be used to push product, and they even had a couple of new direct-to-DVD movies developed around them, but none of it had the staying power that the company desperately needed. So if playing it safe turns off adolescent kids, and playing it extreme turns off traditionalist parents, what kind of audience was Disney even supposed to go after? Mickey Mouse Clubhouse would eventually answer this, but first Disney and the entire industry had to deal with the fact that the landscape of children's television was also going through its own major shift. The boom of programming developed for the sole purpose of selling toys throughout the 80s and 90s had caught the attention of the US government, and so in 1990 they passed the Children's Television Act. Through this, traditional TV broadcasters were not only limited to the types of advertising that could be done during children's television shows, but were now also responsible for airing at least three hours of educational television programming directed at children who were 16 years of age or younger. And it was this mandate that led to the explosion of educational content throughout the 90s and into the 2000s, where previously PBS had cornered the market with heavy hitters like Sesame Street, Barney and Friends, and Arthur. Now everyone needed to be in on the edutainment pool, and it wasn't long before they figured out just how profitable it could actually be. At this time, Disney and its premium subscription service, the Disney Channel, was also going through its own transition. Having launched in 1983 to mix success, executives saw the greener pastures, wider audience, and lack of regulation on basic cable as an easy way to boost profits. The transition was slow, but by 1997, the freshly rebranded Disney Channel was ready to launch its own block of preschool-appropriate TV called Playhouse Disney. And it was within this initial lineup that the younger side of the House of Mouse found its first big hit. Hi. He's very friendly. You're just in time. It's so good to see you. Come on in. He's very talented. I sure do love to cha-cha-cha. He's bear in the big blue house. Now, it's important to recognize that you don't get Mickey Mouse Clubhouse without bear in the big blue house. Launched with Playhouse Disney in 1997 and continuing mostly through 1999, with sporadic episodes running from 2002 to 2006, the show proved to be a critical and commercial hit. More important to the young audience, though, was that Bear in the Big Blue House borrowed the concept of interactivity from shows like Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and Blue's Clues where the characters in the show would ask questions and seek help from viewers, thus helping them feel like they were a part of the action. And most importantly for Disney executives, the massive success of Bear in the Big Blue House, the show, meant lots and lots of opportunities for Bear in the Big Blue House, the merchandise. Throughout its core three-season run, we saw Bear's face plastered on everything from toys, books, video games, and even other TV shows. <laughs> It's you, Kathy Lee. <laughs> what, what, what do you smell, Bear? 
Ooh, you smell like flowers. Thank you. Aww. What does he smell like? <laughs> nice. <laughs> there was one big problem for Disney, though. Bear in the Big Blue House wasn't actually theirs. Even though it aired on the Disney Channel as part of Playhouse Disney, the rights to the show, including characters, content library, copyrights, and merchandising, all belong to its creators of the Jim Henson Company. And while the franchise would eventually be sold to Disney in 2004 as part of the larger Muppet sale, this still meant that the House of Mouse had missed out on a whole lot of licensing money. And we all remember what our friend George Lucas had to say about licensing. It really does come down to uh, a simple rule of life, which is when you break up with somebody, the first rule is no phone calls. The second rule, you don't go over to their house and drive by to see what they're doing. <laughs> the third one is you don't show up at their coffee shop or the things that you're going to burn it. You just say, no, gone, history, I'm moving forward. Ooh, uh, wrong click. I've been able to sustain myself doing Licensing. I've also, read that it's a $20 billion industry. Well, again, yeah, I only get a little portion. Now, by the early to mid-2000s, despite all of this initial success, Disney found themselves in a strange place. Even though Playhouse Disney had exceeded all expectations in terms of viewership and even had a legitimate hit, they just couldn't maximize monetization. And this wasn't just an issue for Bear and the Big Blue House. Other shows within the early lineup, like Roly Poly Oli and Out of the Box, also weren't fully owned by Disney. And so they attempted to rectify this by padding out Playhouse Disney with older programming featuring their recognizable characters, all until new Disney-centric shows could be developed. While franchises featuring Winnie the Pooh and Wonderland were all well and good, it really all came down to finding a way to get Mickey Mouse and his five friends back in front of a captive, <laughs> I mean captivated audience. And having failed to find a place with older audiences, skewing younger seemed like the only way to go. <laughs> Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. <laughs> Weekends at 9, 8 central and 9, 30, 8, 30 central inside Playhouse Disney. Mickey's funny. Mickey Mouse Clubhouse debuted on May 5th, 2006, right as a good chunk of that initial Playhouse Disney lineup were wrapping up their series. It quickly emerged as the new headliner of the block, not only because it featured Mickey Mouse, but also for the fact that the entire world was presented in vibrant, colorful CGI. And while we had technically seen Mickey and Friends animated this way before, with both the Mickey's PhilharMagic Park attraction and Twice Upon a Christmas on DVD, the fact that this target audience was significantly younger helped to sell this saturated yet simplified art style. Instead of the slight update he had used for Mouseworks, or the modern suit-wearing getup used for House of Mouse, creator Bob Scanaway went with a fully classic look for Mickey, complete with a return of the bright red button shorts, chonky yellow shoes, and even his original tail. This character design aesthetic would carry over to the whole clubhouse crew, and when combined with the CGI, gave the characters a fresh but familiar look. And from a strategic perspective, it's easy to see why the show would go this route. By sticking to the classic interpretation of the character, discerning parents could quickly identify him as the same Mickey Mouse they had grown up with, who was more likely to battle a mischievous clam than a vicious Franken-monster. The fact that even the title of Mickey Mouse Clubhouse easily conjures up more memories of the new Mickey Mouse Club of the 70s, or even the all-new Mickey Mouse Club in the early 90s, certainly didn't hurt either. Now, when it comes to the show itself, Mickey Mouse Clubhouse is all about problem solving, and they need you, the audience's help. As creator Bob Scanaway and head writer Leslie Valdez explain, In every episode of Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, Mickey has a problem to solve, and he gets help from the Mouse Cadoer. This is the Mouse Cadoer. It's the supercomputer for preschoolers. Mickey steps up to it in every episode and says, Miska, Muska, Mouse Cadoer! The gears start turning, and a video screen rises up on the Mouse Cadoer and shows us the three, four, or five different mouse tools that we're gonna use that day. Helping us sift through the tools of the week is Toodles, a kind of mobile floating extension of the mouse cadoer. 
whenever Mickey yells out, Oh, Toodles! Toodles comes flying up to the screen so the audiences can pick which tool might be needed to solve the problem. For much of the series, Toodles was presented as a faceless, voiceless, Mickey-shaped computer screen. However, that does change in Season 3. And in later episodes, he's portrayed more as a member of the group rather than just a normal accessory. I, I don't see them around anywhere! A typical episode of Mickey Mouse Clubhouse would start with Mickey asking the audience if they'd like to come inside his clubhouse, before realizing the magic words would need to be spoken in order for it to appear. Miska, Muska, Mickey Mouse! <laughs> After a quick roll call to reinforce the main cast of characters, we're shown the overall problem of the episode. These problems would usually involve finding someone or something, helping a character in need, or completing a specific task that's related to whatever the general theme of the episode is. We're gonna have a colorful day today, so first, let's... Huh? Uh oh what's happening to the clubhouse? Of course, these larger problems would usually break down into smaller problems. Just like your flowers. Mind if we borrow one? Oh, not at all, Mickey. But we'll need to dig it out somehow. Which is where the Mouse Gadur and its tools come in. After Mickey activates the Mouse Gadur, it displays four tools, one being a mystery, that would be used to solve various problems throughout the episode. These tools are then downloaded into Toodles, who will stand at the ready, waiting for his name to be called out. Much like Bear in the Big Blue House before it, the characters of Mickey Mouse Clubhouse would regularly interact both directly and indirectly with the audience, often giving them opportunities to chime in and participate so that they felt included. We pull the red lever when we want to stop the tractor, so which lever makes it go? Well, if red means stop, then green means go. Good and green, good and green. And these interactions would usually build on each other, requiring audience members to utilize previous information that had been presented earlier in the episode. Farmer Pete, why don't you turn the windy mill off? Because I don't know how. Let's see. There are three levers. Red, blue, and green. Remember how the red lever stopped the tractor before? So which lever do you think can make the windmill stop? The red lever! Yeah, cause red means stop. Also similar to Bear in the Big Blue House is how much song repetition plays a major role throughout Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Whether it's the catchy opening, introducing everyone to the clubhouse, saying hi to the Mouse Gadur, or closing out each episode with a ceremonial hot dog dance. It's safe to say that anyone who watched this series for just about any period of time still has one of these rattling around in their head. Hot dog! Mickey Mouse Clubhouse ran for four seasons, with 125 episodes spread out over 10 years. And right from the jump, it was an instant critical and commercial success. The New York Times called out in their review that parents and grandparents finally have someone that they know and trust on the TV set when they wander away to do laundry or pour a stiff drink. That's an awfully specific description. Now with a major hit on their hands that was completely under the umbrella of the House of Mouse, Disney could finally maximize all those sweet, sweet licensing and merchandising opportunities. And maximize they did, with everything from toys, DVDs, books, bedsheets, board games, video games, puzzles, party supplies, and so much, much more. This crazy train never runs out of track. Hop! Because it puts them down in front and picks them up in the back. That was fun! Which is kind of ironic when you consider how much this went against the spirit of the original Children's Television Act 16 years before, which had helped to usher in an entire market that Mickey Mouse Clubhouse was now dominating and selling product to. And you'd better believe that as long as the audience was interested in watching, Disney would keep the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse universe growing. The season three episode, Minnie's Boutique, would act as a lead-in for Minnie Mouse to get her own spin-off titled Minnie's Bow Tunes. 
The short form series, which was aimed at preschool girls, ran from 2011 through 2016, and then returned in 2021 as Minnie's Bow Tunes. Party Palace Pals only to once again return in 2023 as Minnie's Bow Tunes Camp Minnie. The two to five minute episode follows Minnie, Daisy, Clarabelle, Minnie's twin nieces Millie and Melody Mouse, and the newly introduced Cuckoo Loca through the trials and tribulations of running their own group of businesses. Did Bow Tunes get its own line of merch too? Come on, you know it did. Next up was the official follow-up to Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, which wouldn't come until one year after the original series ended. It's cool. It's special. It's an all-new series coming to Disney Junior. See the gang in their new transforming roadsters. Go gear up and go to Hot Dog Hills. Let's get roaster ready. It's an all-new series, Mickey and the Roadster Racers, coming this January. Mickey and the Roadster Racers debuted in 2017 and would run for three seasons, but with the last season being retitled Mickey Mouse Mixed Up Adventures. As you could probably guess from the title, this series has a heavy focus on cars and racing, and so episodes tend to revolve around friendly competition and helping others. Also unique to the series is that the characters no longer talk directly to the audience, and many of the episodes take place in different countries. In one, the gang races around Rome while being chased by a giant meatball. Roadster Racers also integrated aspects of Bow Tunes, with Minnie and Daisy having a breakout segment which features them not racing, but acting as happy helpers around town. But as the series progresses, less and less emphasis is placed on racing. So by the time we get the title switch to Mixed Up Adventures, the gang is traveling to India to participate in a wedding, or spending the day at an amusement park. Another major change here is the return of the hot dog song that would always close out each episode of Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Of course, it's been updated to spice things up a bit, but I wouldn't say that these changes were for the better. The charm and simplicity from the original is pretty much gone. One strange thing about this series in particular is the amount of celebrity cameos sprinkled throughout. The clubhouse had a few, with people like Chloe Grace Moretz and Dick Van Dyke each popping up in an episode. Mixed Up Adventures ramps this up by like a thousand. I mean, it kind of maybe makes sense with Jeff Gordon. I mean, he races cars, or Danica Patrick, she races cars, or even Jay Leno, a car burned his face off. But it's a little strange to hear Gordon Ramsay, or Tim Gunn from Project Runway, or Alice Cooper, who was best known for... I took the chicken and tossed it, thinking it had feathers, it should fly. Well, it didn't fly as much as it plummeted. The audience tore it to pieces. Okay, I, I take that back. That's pretty awesome, actually. Roadster Racers would get its own spin-off with Chip and Dale's Nutty Tales. Much like Bow Tunes before it, Nutty Tales was another short-form series which debuted in 2017, but this time focusing on Chip and Dale, sometimes helping, sometimes causing trouble with the various characters of Mixed Up Adventures. This one wasn't quite as ambitious as any of the other series, and only went for 18 episodes over two seasons. But to make up for that, Roadster Racers and Mixed Up Adventures had four different holiday specials, with Mickey's Tale of Two Witches, Mickey and Minnie Wish Upon a Christmas, Mickey Saves Christmas, and Mickey and Friends Trick or Treats. And yes, of course, Mickey Mouse Mixed Up Adventure and all of its spin-offs had its own line of merch too. Mickey wins. Which brings us to the most current entry in the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse universe. With the end of Mickey Mouse Mixed Up Adventures in 2021, came a fun new twist on the clubhouse. The whole crew is back with amazing new adventures. You're the best friends ever. Mickey Mouse Funhouse, watch on Disney Junior. Debuting that same year and currently scheduled to run through 2024, Funhouse brings back many of the elements from previous series, but adds a heavy layer of fantasy to the mix. Episodes revolve around Funny, an enchanted talking playhouse that can help transport Mickey and the gang to various fantasy worlds. So if the group is wondering if dragons are good or, or bad, they can be transported to medieval times to find out. Or if they're wanting to play music, but don't 
don't have instruments, they can visit Musicville. Here in Musicville, everything is music, music, music. It sure is funny. Whoa! Also along for the ride is Funny's pet doghouse named Teddy, who is good friends with Pluto and sometimes tags along. And then there's Windy, a weather vane that helps Mickey navigate his way to Funny, but also helps everyone solve problems. Kind of like a low rent toodles. Oh, Windy! Now again, Mickey Mouse Funhouse is still airing, but as of now there haven't been any spin-offs. But of course, there's been plenty of merch that's been created. We're under attack! Fire the Yay! And save the ship! All right, baby! Arr! Looking at these other series and spin-offs overall, outside of the cast of characters and general setting and merchandising, the one thing that they all have in common is that they generally drop the heavier educational elements and instead lean on lighthearted storytelling and social lessons. Does that improve things one way or the other? It's kind of hard to say, especially since I'm not exactly the target demographic. But there is something special in having the audience actively work with Mickey to find solutions to problems, rather than passively watch a story play out. Also special is just how long this franchise has managed to enchant its young audience, with close to 400 episodes over 19 seasons. And the wild thing about all of this is that these various series acted as a perfect on-ramp to the eventual mainstream mass appeal relaunch of Mickey Mouse with Paul Rudish's 2013 series. Which means that there are plenty of people out there that have now grown up with Mickey Mouse being a constant presence on their TV set. What's next for the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse universe? Well, like I said, Funhouse is still on the air, but that hasn't stopped Disney from once again looking to the past to help define their future. Likely a response to the fact that Clubhouse is still at the top five most streamed things on Disney Plus 17 years after its original debut, the president of Disney branded television announced on August 18th, 2023, that Disney Junior has greenlit a new version of Mickey Mouse Clubhouse set to premiere in 2025, proving once and for all that it's impossible to deny the staying power of the hot dog dance. See you real soon! All in all, it's pretty crazy to think that Disney's quest for a modern mouse ended with one of their longest running franchises being made for preschoolers. And that's even crazier when you consider the two extreme and the two safe chapters that came before it, which you absolutely need to check out if you want to see the full story.